When I ask you how many have big goals and dreams, what's some personal goal that you have? Someone that you love? The things that the heart can understand and feel, that the mind cannot relate to. Whenever there's an argument between your heart and your mind, follow your heart. What you focus on, what you feel, what you feel, you are moved to somehow actuate. Not what happened that determines the major part of your future. The key is what you do about it. Habits can make you, but they can also break you. You become what you think about, but you also become what you do consistently. Those daily habits, some conscious, some unconscious, will determine if your life is successful or unsuccessful, and if your life is enjoyable or miserable. Performance mattered, not fame, not money, how well did you do at something is what mattered. I've got to get through it. I've got to take a snapshot of the really great moments and carry those with me through the really bad ones. And the trick is taking your blinders off and remembering to look at those photos. And it changes the brain, changes the wiring. And I try to breathe. Breathing changes the wiring but it's conscious. You have to just slow down. You have to cut out all the noise. You have to respect yourself. Getting what you really want and being able to attract it into your life. What's major is to have your mind focused. You don't play with your future. You take the truck charge of your future. Learn something new. And don't take forever to do it. Learn it from somebody who's accomplished and achieved. Life is too short and unpredictable to spend eight or 60 hours a week doing something that's not you. Get an attitude to say, I'm not going out like this. You need a stronger will and a deeper commitment to see things through. It's your time. Maximize this moment. Take advantage of it. So this is another new thing from the last 10 years in neuroscience that was kind of finally discovered, which is you can learn, change, and transfer overnight. So if you look at the night, if you go to sleep and for eight hours sleep, it's not really a uniform experience. Night is not really just you fall asleep and you spend eight hours just in the same state, you actually have phases. We call them stages and cycles. And they have different things that happen in, in them. And one of them is the stage where we're dreaming. That's when we, our brain basically simulates future options and shows us a movie of things that could happen and allow us to live through them, thinking they're reality. It's the ultimate VR. We actually live life thinking that we're there, thinking how it would be to live with her in Alaska or to quit the job and move to Vancouver, really have this experience, filter it through our emotions, and then wake up with the answer what to do. This is one stage, but there's another stage. It's really interesting. Stage three and four of the sleep. We call it slow wave sleep. It's a stage of the night where your brain essentially takes all the experiences from the day before and weights them and chooses which ones to keep and which ones to take out. So if you think about life, when you go through your day, there are many, many moments that you call the present. About every one and a half second, you have a different present, mm. and then it goes into the past. It becomes a memory. And you go to the next moment, and you live it, and then you store it in a memory. Then when you go to sleep, your brain looks at all those 50,000 moments that you had and says, okay, when I walked from home to the bank, I had 20 of those moments, they're not really important. I should compress them into one, keep just one, remove the others. When I kissed her, it was a moment that I want to remember every fraction of. So I want to keep all of them individually as like one like, big stock of like experiences. Mm. Your brain does that during slow wave sleep, during this moment. It kind of chooses out of all of them and picks the ones that are important. What we learned in the last five years, 10 years, is that we can actually do things to you. 
at this stage. When you're sleeping, that will make you change the pointer. We can choose for you to focus on the walk to the bank rather than the kiss. And in doing so, we're going to basically make you strengthen those memories at the expense of others. We do that by using uh, smells or sounds that we play to your ears in the right moment. The smell of the and you kiss. judge that right moment because you're actually watching like a readout. Right. Of what's it going has on, to be done. Right? The, the modern thing is that you can't really do it at home. You can't just spray the smell in the room all the time. You have to do it in the right moment because that if you do, if you just spray smell in the room, it's going to wash out. You have to kind of target the brain in the right moment. But then the brain is going to say, "I smell this thing. This means that I want to focus on this moment and strengthen that." And what the experiments that we're doing and others are doing right now show is that you can actually make a person learn things when they're sleeping. You can actually change their behavior. You can make them uh, uh, choose to focus on different behaviors that they want to change and wake up not doing this thing. You can actually do things. So the, the classical experiment that was really popular in the last three years, 2015, was people come to the lab and they're smokers and they want to quit. They go to sleep for two hours and the experimenters wait for the moment when their brain is in this state where it's kind of listening to the outside world and reassessing life. Then they spray the smell of nicotine into their nose, making their brain think, okay, out of all the memories I have, let's focus on those that have to do with smoking. Mm. And then immediately after, they blast the brain with the smell, of rotten, the smell of rotten eggs, which basically makes the brain rewire and, for, and, and take nicotine and wire it with like bad experiences. So you do that a few times when they're sleeping, they wake up, they have no idea what happened, but then suddenly they say, I don't really want to smoke anymore. For a few days, they actually change their behavior. They don't want to smoke, not knowing what happened. They just came, took a nap, wake up, and they don't want to smoke. This is a changing behavior, neuroscience. Wow. You find the moment, you hit the brain with it, you change the wiring, and the person wakes up a different person. That is amazing. Do people freak out about that? Like, good or bad? <laughs> the answer is they do, but they shouldn't. And I have an analogy that's going to uh, be the kind of way I look at it. Go back 406 years ago, uh, 1610 Galileo Galilei points his telescope to the moons of Jupiter and he looks at their orbit and he expects it to go in one way, but it doesn't. It goes in a different way. And he kind of tries to understand what's going on there. And the only way to solve the equation is to realign the planets of our Milky Way galaxy and specifically the solar system by putting the sun in the center and put Earth as the number three planet in the system, mm -hmm. which to him is a the throne of humankind. What does it mean that we're just one more planet out of many, we're not the center? It, it feels horrible to him. It changes everything, but the equations require that, so he does it. And in doing so, he basically allows us to now see the wide riches of the universe. Suddenly we see that the universe is much bigger than we imagined, and we can explore it. And in the next 400 years, we saw more of the universe, and we learned a lot about what is out there. Now, in the same way, in the last five years, we're beginning to understand that in our own brain, there are many, many voices, and we are not the most important one. We're not even the center. We're just one more voice out of many in our head, wow. and we're the one who thinks that the most important, but actually the quiet <laughs> ones that don't really talk to us are the center of our universe. Now, this to us, again, feels like a deep one of humankind. What does it mean that I'm not the center of my own universe? But the reality is that this will allow us to understand the most important and interesting thing in the universe, which is us. That's, I think, a profound understanding. Yes, it's scary that we're not responsible for our choices, that they happen to us, that we're creating a narrative based on things that we're not really fully in control. But that's the beauty of us, because now we can actually explore more things in our brain and learn how things happen. And maybe we'll understand how to become better people. Now, another principle is you've got to drop out of the Ain't It Awful Club. What does that mean? It means you have to surround yourself with positive people. We saw when Maryam's arm went down up here when you all did negative thoughts about her. And how many of you think about this? Where do you spend your time? Is it with positive people or is it with negative people? You have to be very careful about where you put yourself. Jim Rohn said, again, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Who do you spend the most time with? They're a mirror back to you at what level your life is actualizing at. If your friends are victims and their lives aren't working and their marriages don't work and they're not making money, that's a reflection back. If you're working out with people and hanging out with people that are at a higher level, then that's a reflection back. And what I teach people is always try to get with the people that are the next level up. You're making 50,000 a year, you want to make 100,000, find some people making 100,000, spend some time with them, however you have to do that. You know, if you want to be more spiritual, go to some spiritual retreats where spiritual people hang out. Get in their space, learn what they do, how they think, etc. 
We had a story in the second uh, helping of Chicken Soup for the Soul. Carl Coleman's driving to work when his car collides with another woman's car, and they get out, and she's crying, and he's like relieved. This is a minor fender bender. Why are you crying? She said, you don't understand. This is a brand new car, three days from the showroom. How am I going to explain this to my husband? He said, well, I'm really sorry about that, but we need to get your registration, your driver's license, your insurance record, so we can, you know, exchange that data so we can file our accident reports. So she goes into the glove compartment of her car, opens up the manila envelope and everything's in and on top of that there's a message written in handwriting by her husband and it said in case of accident remember honey it's you I love not the car see the women all go oh the men are thinking yeah right I don't know about that but why do we all go oh we all go oh because that's what we want in life we want someone to love us more than anything else especially things vases that have been in the family for three generations the white carpet your special sweater whatever and when we know that we're loved unconditionally then you feel safe and when you feel safe you get creative and when you get creative you come up with ideas that can quantum leap your success so that's why it's so important stories are basically the operating system of the human brain you know, if you look across the board, across a bunch of areas of, of research, it's quite fascinating. Um, uh, John Gottman, who's done leading expert in terms of uh, you know, relationships, marriages, the most indicating thing in terms of whether a couple will get uh, divorced or not is how they tell their story, is merely saying, oh, so tell me the story of your relationship. How did you two meet? And if it's, oh my God, it was so wonderful, it was this and great, and then we had challenges, but we overcame them, we got to know each other better, we grew together, versus, you know, it's like, oh, we met up, and we had, you know, so we've had some problems, but I mean, <laughs> you know, just hearing that story is a huge indicator in terms of the success of children. Um, if, a chil if a child knows its family history, it's a huge impact on how successful that kid is in school, how well adjusted. Example adjusted. of that, like when you say knows their family story, what do you mean? Again, that issue of, okay, your, your great-grandfather, uh, you know, immigrated here from this. And We've if they tell a story that's sort of positive and empowering. And they're a part of something. They're a part of something. It gives reason. It gives meaning. Mm. And what you see across the board with that, with, uh, you know, when you look at what therapists do very often is, uh, is fixing people's stories. I'm a loser, I've always been a loser, this didn't work out, that didn't work out, I can't. Versus, you can take the same events and say, oh, this didn't work out, but that's the day I learned a great lesson, which, same events, but you're telling them in a different way. So very often, it's not about the specifics of what happened. We've all had successes, we've all had failures, but which ones do we choose to define ourselves by? It's that story in our head that keeps us going. And so it's deeply important for meaning, but also deeply important in terms of you know, grit, resilience, persistence. Because again, that story you tell yourself, are you the kind, do you tell yourself, I'm the kind of person who, oh, I, I'm never gonna make it through this. I've, 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 I quit at this, I quit at that. I quit. Or, you know, I'm not a quitter. That's the story I tell myself. People want to seek out things that support their story, they want to fulfill their story. We all know someone who, who has this vision of their self in a certain way, and you present them with that challenge of, oh, you know, oh, you, you think you're so smart? Well, could you do that? And people often jump to the challenge. Why? Because they want to support their story. And we have this evolving story of ourselves, and it's, it's really critical, you know, for, for us to feel that, you know, we are part of this, because we've all had how many moments in our lives, how many ups, how many downs, we don't remember all of them. We don't recall all of them and we don't make all of them part of our story. There's a thousand different ways to frame the decades that have gone by. We can shape them many ways. And how we do actually has a huge effect on whether we persist, how happy we are, and the decisions we make going forward. 